Okay, um, so we start again. So next is uh, Jonathan Boo talking about Rocket and Kubernetes. Um, yeah, it's your stage. Okay. Thanks for thanks. coming over. All right, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. <clears throat> um, as you mentioned, today I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, Rocket and Kubernetes um, and some of the things that have been happening more recently uh, in this area and how we integrate the two. Um, so just for a little context, uh, I'm Jonathan Bull. I'm John Bull on GitHub, and this little bear sort of follows me around the internet. And I work at uh, CoreOS, where I've been for about <clears throat> two years now, working on a bunch of different things, a bunch of different open source software. Um, I, I, I like to, to give a little context for you know why we're we talking about these things. Um, so like you know the first question might be why am I here talking about Rocket and Kubernetes today? But the more sort of general question um, is like why are we why are we talking about uh, container runtimes and orchestration? So these are two um, topics, two areas we work in a lot at, at CoreOS, and we think are very important for sort of the future of the industry. Um, and obviously they're very popular in the open source world at the moment. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about you know our context, our history for why we're we're working. On these things, because it it, mot it sort of um, <clears throat> that context explains um, and our sort of motivation drives you know some of the design decisions that we make um, and the technologies that we choose to work on um, and how we're de architecting this software. So CoreOS started about two years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's a company, but it's fundamentally it's a lot of bunch of open source software. Um, and the sort of mission of the company is to secure the internet, which is kind of this grandiose mission. Um, and the main sort of idea there is that you know software is always going to be insecure. There's always going to be vulnerabilities, and so the best way to to deal with that, like sensibly, is just to make sure that updating is as seamless as possible. Um, so we started at the operating system level with an open source uh, Linux distribution, CoreOS Linux, which is a self-updating operating system. So it's quite a minimal sort of operating system, a minimal distribution of Linux, um, there's no package manager, for example. Um, so what you get, what is baked into the operating system is what you get. And it's a, a read-only sort of uh, uh, operating system image. And you know, we're constantly, every time that there's a, a, an update, we're pushing that out automatically. And the update gets pulled down, applied to the operating system. Um, your system reboots to apply the update, um, and you get the latest version. So you know, that's kind of where we started at CoreOS, is working on this operating system. But you know. At the end of the day, why are people running operating systems? Well, typically they're, they're providing applications. So, you know, since we're here talking at the data center conference, we're mostly talking about servers that are running in data centers uh, that are providing, you know, web services and other kind of services to 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 customers and to clients, to users. So, if we're going to be updating the operating system and then, you know, rebooting everything or changing the underlying uh, software in the operating system, well, what about these applications and services that we're running and that we're providing? How can we provide you know, continuity of service? And so this is really the classic, one of the classic use cases for, for these two, two uh, solutions. You know, on the one side, uh, container runtimes, um, and then on the other side, uh, orchestration. So container you know, decouples the operating system from the application that's running on it so that you can uh, update the software in the operating system without affecting uh, the application. And then orchestration allows you to um, provide sort of high availability between the life of the, the uptime of the operating system, the uptime of one server, and the uptime of the actual you know, service that your application is providing. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. I'll show, show what that looks like in, in, uh, visually in a minute. So the first side of that, container runtimes. Um, as I said, the idea is that we can, you know, at CoreOS, we provide this self-updating operating system, and we want to be able to push out those updates without affecting your applications that are running on the operating system. So, you know, if anyone's you know not familiar with the idea of containers and what that looks like, just to give you an idea here, um, you know, in a kind of classic Linux distribution world, uh, everything to the left of this distro line is what the operating system provider is responsible for. So, you know, the kernel and, and basic like init init functionality like systemd and SSH to provide you know remote access. But then also a lot of um, application libraries and sort of databases and, and things like that, um, language runtimes like Python and Java, they're all provided as part of the operating system. And what that means is when the operating system vendor wants to push out a new update, they have to be careful because um, they might end up you know, affecting the app that's leveraging all these libraries. So moving to this containerized world, um, pushes all those dependencies into the into the responsibility of the application itself. So now, you know, the distro is this much smaller set of software on the left. And as we control that, a much smaller set of software that doesn't have this strict dependency between with the application, then we can update this at a different cadence, you know, without affecting the application. Um, 
this means that applications then need to include all their you know, dependencies with themselves in their containers. Um, but it also means that then they can potentially run, you know, decouples applications from each other. So you can potentially run multiple applications on the same system with multiple versions of libraries. Um, wouldn't necessarily recommend running multiple versions of SSL because one of them's probably broken. But uh, this is to give you an idea of, of, of you know, <coughs> uh, what, you know, what container, one of the classic reasons why we use container runtimes and why we're interested in them. Um, and this is what CoreOS is. So CoreOS Linux is, you know, everything on the left, just that, that minimal container, uh, the minimal operating system, and then users run their applications in containers on top of it. Um, you know, in different container runtimes. So in CoreOS, we support things like uh, Docker out of the box um, and the Rocket runtime, which I'm going to talk about in more detail. Um, and then also sort of even simpler things like nSpawn. Um, which means every time you execute a container, it's this fully self-contained environment there. So that's why we you know, have container runtimes and why we're interested in them, why we started working on them at, at CoreOS and how we use them to, to, you know, to drive our updates forward. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about orchestration and where that fits in. So the basic idea is that let's say you have a, you know, this cluster of servers and each of these servers is running some applications. Um, in this case, you know, apps one through seven and you know, Server one, as I said, it's you know the op operating system is automatically updating, so there's no intervention from the user, from the administrator. So the server one pulls down an update, applies it to to the file system, and then it decides, oh, I need to reboot because to you know to update the operating system, to update the kernel, um, we need to actually do a full reboot to get into the new file system. Um, we have some of you might be wondering, oh, what about things like uh, kexec to be able to like update on the fly? And you know the short answer is that does work in some environments, but it's not. Um, it's not always entirely clean and it's not supported in every environment, so there can be some tricky interactions depending on like a hypervisor that you're running on. And with CoreOS, one of our, the ideas is to have this same operating system you can use across any different platform, whether you're running in your own data center or in AWS. And so for consistency across these environments and to be able to get into this new read-only file system, we always uh, apply a reboot. So the server needs a reboot, but it still has these applications running on it. And you know, ideally, we want them to keep running. So without any orchestration, when the server reboots, then we're just going to completely lose those applications while the server's, uh, while the server's out of service. With orchestration, um, you know, in this case, the update's been downloaded and server one realizes, hey, I need to apply this update. I'm going to reboot. It can, the orchestra orchestrator can react to this and um, shuffle the apps around. So it can move those applications to another server in the cluster. And then while that server one is rebooting and applying the new update, um, there's no loss in, in, in service there. Once the service comes, server comes back, then the orchestrator can, if it wants, it can rebalance. And you know, in this case, it's actually moved a different application back, but just to make sure that there's, um, the applications are distributed among the cluster. So I was talking about sort of a magical orchestrator. Um, for us, you know, there's a few different options there. Some of the most popular being um, uh, Mesos and Kubernetes. Um, and for us at CoreOS, we mo work um, mostly around uh, Kubernetes. Um, we, think it's, we think it's one of the best uh, orchestrators out there. Um, and so Kubernetes is what provides that high availability to move the applications around the cluster um, to, to mitigate sort of down server downtime. So again, why, why are we working on these two technologies at CoreOS? Why are we interested in them? Um, and it's all about so that we can provide these updates to the operating system and sort of drive forward security and application uh, servers. And then once we, once we finish sort of thinking about that, once we feel that's a solved problem at the server level, um, or in parallel really, we also start to work on that at the application level, driving out, um, providing seamless updates to applications. And that's where the technology like Kubernetes really allows you to do that in a first class way. So that's sort of why we're interested in these technologies more generally, but why, why specifically um, Rocket um, um, as a container runtime? So to go over a bit of a history of the last couple of years, um, back in 2014, um, CoreOS was about a year old, the, the distribution, and we shipped um, you know, Docker as the main container runtime. Um, and we had, at the time, you know, the CoreOS, some of the CoreOS developers were some of the key maintainers uh, or, or top contributors to Docker. But um, you know, at the time, as container runtime technology was becoming more and more popular, um, you know, we thought that there were some practices in the industry that weren't, we didn't feel were necessarily best practices. And certainly, as far, uh, definitely as far as sort of security goes, and then as far as integrating this um, technology with the operating system. Um, so some of the classic examples was that at the time, uh, you know, in, images weren't generally weren't uh, weren't signed in any way, 
um, when they were distributed around the internet. And we also didn't feel that the build, uh, the way, the, the sort of de facto uh, ways of building images were necessarily the most efficient or sort of secure. And then we had um, trouble, you know, integrating this technology with things like SystemD, which is um, SystemD sort of forms the core of, of CoreOS, um, as we were one of the earlier distributions to adopt SystemD um, as an init system, um, and we try to integrate it with it as much as possible. We think it's, you know, the future of, of Linux distributions, basically, since it's now been adopted by every major distribution. And so every tool that we integrate into CoreOS, we want to be able to work really nicely with um, SystemD. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of a lot of sort of problems with Docker's interaction with SystemD. Um, one of the classic ones is uh, well, I can talk about that a bit more detail later on. So. Uh, at the time, since we felt that we weren't able to have these, some of these concerns addressed uh, upstream, um, there were various you know, issues that, that the Docker developers didn't feel fit into the project. Um, we decided to create this new project, uh, Rocket, as an alternative, um, with three kind of main drivers. First was really just to you know, create an alternative in the ecosystem and sort of drive innovation, because we're big believers in open source you know, innovation, competition driving you know, new features and, and pushing the software forward. And we think that you know, users should have alternatives. Um, and then one of the second big conversations we wanted to start was around uh, security and composability. So as I said, uh, some of these, you know, at the time, the Docker ecosystem we felt wasn't taking ser security very seriously. And it's something we, you know, was very important to us since that's part of our mission. And, and also composability in terms of being able to integrate container runtimes with different systems. So with the operating system and with other, with orchestration systems, for example. Um, and then finally, we wanted to uh, spur this conversation around standards in the ecosystem. Um, we're big believers in, in open standards at CoreOS. Um, and the uh, sort of uh, interest there is that we want people to be able to build tools. You know, when you have a standard, when you have stuff that's written down, then people can go and build tools against them to integrate with them. They don't need to buy into a particular a set of tooling um, and, you know, not be sure what the future is. So that's, where, that's how Rocket came about. Um, and now sort of three-line tagline of Rocket is that it's, you know, it's a modern, secure container runtime, um, and it's, a, but it's also just a simple kind of composable tool. And then finally, it's, a, it's an implementation of open standards. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these in kind of reverse order. So as I said, um, you know, we wanted Rocket to be an implementation of open standards, but at the time, there weren't really open standards for what a container is. Um, and there were different, you know, a lot of people would use container to talk about maybe an LXC container or maybe a Docker container, um, but it wasn't really written down what that meant. It's sort of just a, uh, you know, implementation dependent, and it could mean, oh, it might be, maybe I'm talking about some C groups and some namespaces on Linux, or maybe I'm talking about uh, a group of files in a tarball or, you know, different things like that. Maybe I'm just talking about a cheroot. So, the goal of the AppC project, which we started at the same time as Rocket, is that um, we actually write down what exactly an application container is. So it is a set of files you know, in a, in a tarball. Um, it is an, an execution environment which consists of this and this and this in a way that uh, anyone can go out and, and build things to interoperate with, with things that conform to AppC. So there are kind of three main areas of the AppC project or the AppC spec. The first, as I said, is the image format. So that's just like literally a bunch of files in a tarball. Um, you know, all container runtimes and most package managers have pretty sim similar, sim similar ideas of what images are. But we wanted to write that down and codify it so that um, we could make images um, you know, more easily distributable around the internet in a secure way. Um, we, one of the things we wanted to get away from was necessarily having kind of monolithic um, image discovery. So we wanted to... Um, be able to, for example, for you, anyone to be able to host their own images and for other people to be able to find and discover them and download them securely in kind of a known way um, rather than having everyone having to run their own uh, custom repository or things like that. Um, and then the second big part of the AppC spec is around pods, um, which is the sort of grouping of applications. I'll talk a bit, bit more about that in a sec. Um, and then finally, the kind of nuts and bolts of like what it is to run a container. So what C groups and namespaces you can expect, um, what the execution environment looks like uh, to the application. So what it can expect to act when it's actually running in a container. Um, so pods, as I said, that's like the, the second part of the spec, and that's the fundamental execution unit. So the idea here is that um, you know, Google sort of pioneered or uh, popularized this idea that, um, you know, it's a very, very common pattern to run multiple applications together in this shared context, um, which they, you know, they found over their sort of 10, 15 years of, of running 
<coughs> of running uh, containers at scale, of running applications at scale in their data centers, they found that this pattern just kept re-emerging, where you might want to run like a database, and then right next to the database, you might want a little backup agent or something like that. And you want them to share maybe some disk and memory and be sort of isolated from other things on the system, but to be very uh, tightly related together. And the idea is that that also becomes your um, core scheduling unit. So when you're talking about scheduling things in a cluster somewhere, you're actually always going to be thinking about those things being scheduled together. Um, and that they share fate. So if one of them dies, the database dies, then the backup worker dies alongside it. And so in AppC, we made this the only execution primitive. So um, instead of just thinking about executing applications one by one, everything's in a pod. So even, a, even just running a single application is in a single singleton pod. And this definition is completely synonymous with uh, Kubernetes pods, basically. Um, in AppC, we talk about it at quite a high level because we're, uh, there's some implementations across different, um, different platforms. Whereas in Kubernetes, at the mo as of today, the only implementation is on Linux. So they talk about sort of Linux namespaces and C groups. Um, but in principle, this can be applied across different platforms. Um, and we have implementation of AppC on FreeBSD, for example, which implements the pod using completely different technologies to, uh, to that on Linux. So that was the, the sort of first part of bit about Rocket, that it implements this uh, open standard AppC. Um, but that was, as I said, that was almost kind of two years ago when the AppC project came out. And you, know, you might have heard little bits and pieces about it since then, but you know, today it's not actually what we call 1.0. And I'm going to explain a little bit about you know, where that is and, and, and what's actually happening. So jumping forward to now, um, about a year and a half on from creating apps, AppC and Rocket. Um, you know, Docker and Rocket are both considered like 1.0, production ready, being actively used in production. Um, so is Kubernetes. And then what's been happening with around all this sort of standard stuff that we tried to like kick off this discussion around? Well, as I said, AppC came out at the end of 2014. Um, and about six months later, in June 2015, um, the Linux Foundation announced a, uh, a new project uh, or new foundation in the Linux Foundation called the Open Container Initiative, um, which was sort of spearheaded by Docker, but CoreOS was also a, a, a part of that from the beginning. And in principle, the goal of the Open Container Initiative was to standardize the stuff around containers. Um, most of the groups that you know, joined the initiative were hoping, were, um, hoping that it would standardize the container image format, for example. Um, and the nice part about that is that then all these different you know, providers, you know, Google and Amazon, but also just open source, open source implementations like Coros implementations, Docker implementations, anyone's custom implementation could create their own you know, registry to serve images and things like that, and, and all agree on this common image format. Um, and then you know, a few months later, in, in December 2015, another, the Linux Foundation created another foundation um, called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, which is a little bit less you know, oriented directly around standards, but the idea of cl the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, is to sort of harmonize these different emerging technologies around um, containers and microservices. So uh, basically running apps in containers with using orchestrators and things like that. Um, and so to touch on CNCF, um, as of a month or two ago, um, Kubernetes, for example, has donated to the CNCF, so it's now um, a CNCF project. Um, and we ho we're hopeful that some other software uh, in, that <clears throat> in the similar space is also going to become part of the CNCF. Um, but, but setting back to OCI, since, as I said, this was a new project that was ostensibly around um, creating uh, this image format, um, you might be asking, well, then, why does AppC still exist? Um, to be honest, we didn't really, we don't really want it to. We had wanted it to um, essentially to merge the two projects and for AppC to become part of OCI because we don't have any particular attachment to you know AppC in itself. We just want there to be an image format that everyone can agree on. Um, but unfortunately, it sort of quite quickly emerged that uh, the main creators of the OCI were only interested in standardizing just the lim limited part, um, the runtime format. So I talked about how AppC has these three areas like the image format, um, pods, and then the runtime like the runtime environment. And that runtime environment was the only bit that the OCI was uh, initially interested in concentrating on. Um, to us, that doesn't really provide much value because it's sort of a very low-level implementation detail. Um, you know, as a user, as a developer, as an administrator, uh, you probably don't care that much about the internals of, of uh, the execution. You, you're more interested, probably more interested in like the image format. So when you're talking about building your software and deploying it in an image and hosting it somewhere and then transmitting it securely and things like that. So that's why um, you know, AppC kind of continued to exist, continued to have a, have a place in the world. Um, but fortunately, as of a month or two ago, um, after a lot of politicking, um, the OCI has announced 
now announced that they will creating an image format um, alongside the existing the, the runtime format that they've been working on slowly over the last sort of uh, last year or, or last nine months or so. And now, finally, in this new image spec project, um, we are hoping to you know merge in all of the kind of lessons that we learned developing AppC uh, and take all the lessons from the latest uh, Docker image format. Um, and sort of merge them into one single image spec that you know all container runtimes can hopefully agree on, and we can start to put into things like the Kubernetes API. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, sort of the latest Docker. Or I can talk a little bit, show you what that looks like. Um, oh, and to give you an idea of the maintainers of this new format, um, it's a pretty interesting representation of you know some some of the bigger players in the industry, um, but also a few uh, consists of a couple of maintain a few maintainers from the AppC spec as well as um, obviously representation from Docker. So we're really hopeful that this will be finally be the opportunity for us to all uh, agree on something. Um, and to give you an idea of of the, what these different formats formats offer, um, so. You know, as I said, we saw things started with kind of the Docker format um, being kind of the de facto standard, but it wasn't um, written down anywhere. And it had a few um, things we thought were shortcomings. So that's why we, what prompted us to create AppC. Um, subsequent to AppC, um, Docker actually put in a lot of effort to uh, creating a next generation image format that ended up looking quite similar or implementing a lot of the things that we had needed. Um, and so we decided as we decided to uh, actually to kind of, in the interests of harmonizing and moving forward, we decided that the OCI next generation image format will be based on the Docker v2 format. Um, and we're still going to add some concepts from AppC that hadn't quite made it into the, the Docker 2 format uh, yet. Um, and then uh, the idea is to have backwards compatibility so that uh, we can, you know, move forward with this new image format with all the features that we need, but keep providing service, uh, continuity of service to end users. So you might be wondering why the hell is he talking about this stuff, what's interesting about container standards, and honestly, you probably um, shouldn't care too much. Um, this is just something that I've been thinking about and working on a lot. Um, but, you know, the goal here is that, you know, things should just work for you, but you should be able to, more importantly, you should be able to use these different tools um, and to, you know, to, to run images, to run applications, but they should just work and it should work in a secure way um, and a consistent way. So you should be able to use different container runtimes to reference the same kind of image um, and have kind of predictable results. That's really our goal here. Um, and for administrators, um, you know, since, since we are tr really trying to push having these things like image signing um, and potentially image encryption kind of built into the core spec, um, we want that to be, that should be more appealing to administrators looking to deploy container runtimes more securely. Um, and also, but allowing that, having that standard means you can, you know, mix and match tools. You don't need to buy into an entire stack. Um, you can potentially write your own tools or use different bits and pieces uh, from the ecosystem. Um, so now I'm going to, that was, that was a bit about standards, kind of getting you up to date on what's happening there. Um, and then I want to talk a bit about the architecture of Rocket itself. So Rocket is, a, as I said, it's sort of a simple composable tool. So it's basically just a command line tool, RKT. Um, and the key architectural, you know, difference here at the, t at the time from, from Docker was that there's no central daemon through which all of your containers are executed. Um, and there's no API, it's just the command line interface. There actually is an API, which is quite new, but um, it's an optional part of Rocket, um, and I could, I'll talk about what that's for. Um, and then since every pod executes in a self-contained way, um, you, you get this nice effect of being able to inherit the environment from wherever you execute it. So as an example, if you do a Rocket run command, just you know, from whichever context it's invoked, from if you just run it a command line or from systemd, or you know, for our purposes today, if it's invoked from the kubelet, um, it directly inherits whatever parameters ap apply from that context, um, and that gets passed on to the applications. So, for example, any you know resource constraints or whatever you apply to the Rocket process will apply to the applications uh, as well. Um, so, internally, Rocket's uh, execution is divided into into three different stages: stage zero, stage one, stage two. Um, and one of these stages, stage one, is swappable. And the point of that is that we think, um, you know, different container containers technologies, since they're so modern and still a very rapidly evolving area, that uh, new con new kind of containment technologies are going to emerge um, that we can take advantage of. And we want to be able to swap them into Rocket and use them, you know, to maybe more securely contain things, but have the same user experience to to end users. And so, since we define, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the fundamental execution unit is always a pod. So actually when I say applications here, Rocket's really just running a pod. 
and then to break that down into the different stages, um, this is sort of where all the stages sit. So stage zero is that command line interface um, to end users. And so that, that, that always stays the same. So that defines what users can expect. Um, and then the pod is kind of the stage one execution environment. And that's what you think of as your container. And then within the pod, you know, run your actual applications that you develop and you package as images. So stage zero, as I said, you know, it's a command line interface, does all the sort of basic things you would expect a container runtime to do, like it can fetch images, discover them over the internet, um, sets up the file system on disk, it can list the images that you have in your local store, it can garbage collect old pods, things like that. Stage one is where all the interesting stuff happens. Um, so that's where the pod gets executed. And as I said, it's swappable. So we have a you know, default implementation today that is based around classic Linux containers, C groups, and namespaces. And, and to do that, we actually just use um, systemd spawn. Uh, and then we also have a first-class implementation that's um, based around KVM, um, contributed by the Intel folks at Intel. And so we use the LKVM, um, LKVM which is a user space um, virtualization tool um, that allows you that spins up a, a VM very very quickly and allows you to have your pod executing uh, in that VM. So you get the advantage of you know hardware isolation, um, hardware extensions to isolate that pod from others on the system. And then we also have a couple of proposals for alternative engines, like for example, an XHive one would mean that rocket pods could uh, execute on uh, OS X. And that actually shouldn't be too much work necessarily. Um, it's just we don't have any rocket developers who work on OS X at the moment. Um, and then there's also an interesting one around UNC, which is uh, uh, written in Go, and it's a, the idea is to create con totally unprivileged containers. So you don't need to be root, since classically on Linux, you need root to run uh, containers. And then um, the final stage, stage two, that's just your application executing inside the pod. So um, that's when we talked about what the runtime environment is. Um, it's just what your app can expect to see. So your app can expect to see its file system, you know, its image, um, and it can expect to have access to maybe shared volumes that you've mounted into the pod, um, and to, ha to share different namespaces with the other apps in the pod, and to share networking, for example. Um, oh, missing a slide. So some of the things that are quite new with Rocket um, is one of the one of the one of the features that we added in the last few months is called TPM measurement. Um, so the TPM, the Trusted Platform Module, for any of you who don't know, it's this it's a physical chip on most modern um, Intel motherboards uh, that you know has a set of cryptographic keys in a processor um, that performs some simple kind of cryptographic measurements. And the idea is that it's, it use, it's done what's called in TPM uh, verbiage is to measure the system state. So the idea is that you can, uh, when code is executing on the CPU, you can, um, the TPM will kind of snapshot what code is being loaded, and then it will write that into its little log. Um, so you can kind of measure the whole process of, of uh, what's being executed on the system. So historically, this is only possible with, um, basically with Microsoft uh, servers. But one of the developers at, at CoreOS added support to Grub, you know, which is the bootloader that we use and most Linux distributions use. And so now you can actually verify the, the boot process, the Linux boot process, um, using this uh, trusted uh, module on the, on the motherboard. Um, we also recently added support to Rocket so that you get this sort of train of trust from uh, the boot to um, the operating system and up to like what's running on the system. So you know, when you actually boot the, when you actually physically power on the machine, um, this, uh, you know, the TPM will actually measure the firmware that gets loaded, and then it will measure the, the, the bootloader and measure the, you know, the operating system that boots up. And then now that with the support in Rocket, it will actually measure every single uh, container that you launch with Rocket. So it'll actually write into its audit log, um, you know, here's what was actually executed on the system. Um, and this is, you know, nowadays with many people running in the cloud, this isn't necessarily so important to them, but we've had a lot of users who run, you know, on their physical hardware and their own data centers. Um, and this is a nice additional kind of security mechanism um, to, to, to be able to trust what's executing on your hardware. Um, the other thing that was added to Rocket recently was the API service. So I mentioned that you know, we don't have a mandatory API service in Rocket. You can run it without it, but there's an optional daemon that can, you can start on a system that has Rocket, and it exposes information about what's running on the system in a much more kind of efficient way. Uh, so you know, information around pods and images that are on the system, instead of having to run the you know, Rocket command to do that, you can just talk to this simple gRPC daemon and get that information. The other nice thing about this excuse me, is that we can run it as an unprivileged user. It doesn't need to be root. So we don't need to have any long-running um, root daemons on the system. Um, and we do that basically through just 
pretty much just through um, leveraging different sort of Unix permissions on the file system to control access to, to, to stuff. Um, and that's, that's uh, one of the key parts of our integration with Kubernetes, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. So again, these are the sort of the, you know, why Rocket? Um, we think uh, you should use Rocket because it's, you know, secure, security minded. Um, it's always trying to integrate new security features um, uh, and have things secure by default. So we have try to have all secure things um, as on by default if possible and then opt out rather than opt in so that people can take advantage of them by default. Um, also because it's, you know, we have a very strong emphasis on standards. So as I said, we, you know, uh, any standard that emerges, we're going to try and support um, and work actively to develop good standards for users. Um, and finally, that it's composable, so it can integrate very nicely with your different different tools. And one of those tools is Kubernetes. So I want to talk about how Rocket and Kubernetes uh, integrate. Um, there's actually three kind of key ways that we use um, the Kubernetes and Rocket uh, go together. Um, the first of them, which I'll probably mostly talk about is, is Rocket Netties, and that's using Kubelet, uh, that's using Rocket inside of uh, Kubernetes itself. And then the second way is kind sort of the flip side is actually using Rocket to run Kubernetes. Um, so using Rocket to run Kubernetes, and then you can use Rocket inside Kubernetes to run different applications. Um, and then finally, there's been a lot of overlap between the Rocket networking um, and the Kubernetes networking. So I'll talk a bit about what's happening there. So um, hopefully you're all uh, familiar with somewhat familiar with Kubernetes, but um, if, not, if you're not familiar with what the Kubelet is, basically it's an agent that lives on every node in the Kubernetes cluster, and that's what's responsible for actually running your applications, running your containers. Um, and the way that that happens is that agent delegates out to a container runtime. So it's, by default, it, to, it actually just talks to Docker, and Docker starts up the applications. The Kubelet itself doesn't, um, doesn't run, doesn't know, you know, it's not a container runtime. It doesn't know how to start a container. It just knows how to talk to a runtime. And the way that's implemented today is that there's an interface, a, a Go interface in the, in the actual Kubelet code um, called um, Container Runtime Interface. And it has a different sets of methods, like, for example, the sync pod method, the get pod method, the kill pod method. And then for each runtime that you want, you just need to implement, in theory, implement that method. So for example, for by default, we would have a sync pod method that um, talks to Docker and knows how to create a pod using Docker. So in theory, it's quite easy to, you know, for anyone to implement this interface, but in practice, there's a lot of different assumptions in the code about um, Docker. So it's not a very clean interface. Um, and there were a lot of, uh, as we, you know, added support for Rocket, there were a lot of problems we came across where we need to refactor a lot of the Kubelet code. Um, to give you an idea of what that looks like architecturally, like on the system. So by default, you know, you have the Kubelet. This is, imagine that these are just kind of processes on the system. And you have the Kubelet running um, somewhere on the system. And then when it needs to start to do any of these pod interactions, it talks to the Docker daemon. And it does that over the Docker, the Docker API that they expose. And then the Docker, it's Docker daemon itself um, st starts up uh, individual containers. So some of the problems with this model that you know, motivated us to work on Rocket and to integrate Rocket and Kubernetes. Um, the first problem is that Docker doesn't understand pods, so it just understands individual containers. Um, and that's a, that can be a problem because you know, the Kubelet then needs to maintain a lot of information around you know, which containers belong to a pod, um, since Docker just considers it like a flat pool of different containers. And then also the Kubelet needs to maintain a special container, which they call a sleep pause container or an infra container, to uh, hold all the namespaces for the other containers in the pod. So they basically just have a container that sits there um, just running sleep, basically, and Definitely, and then they need to join the other containers to it. It's a bit of a sort of patchwork way to assemble a pod. Um, another, the second kind of problem is that the Docker daemon can be a single point of failure in the sense that if the Docker daemon dies in this scenario, then it takes down all the containers with it. Um, and then finally, we you know had problems with Docker interacting with system D. Um, this actually initially wasn't really a problem for uh, Kubernetes because they did most of their development on a version of Debian that didn't have system D yet. But now as you know, all the distributions are moving to system D, uh, this is going to be more and more of a problem uh, in future. And it was a problem for us running, uh, system D, uh, running Kubernetes on CoreOS. Um, so that, as I said, that's kind of the architecture today. But actually, um, you know, in terms of recent developments, uh, this is uh, soon going to be out of date as Kubernetes looks to update Docker, um, because in newer versions of Docker, Docker is moving to a, a slightly different model uh, where they're splitting out the run container runtime part from the daemon itself, which we think is, is partly a good thing, um, sort of partly one of the things we were pushing for, but there are some other kind of problems that emerge here. 
So if you might have heard of um, ContainerD, which I was in the last release of Docker, was the first release to have this um, split between the Docker daemon and the execution uh, thing. So now uh, the Docker daemon, which you know, is still what you talk to on the command line or with, from Kubelet, actually talks to another daemon um, to spin up individual containers. Um, and the nice part about this, in theory, is that then you can you know, survive the Docker daemon restarting, for example, without affecting the life of your containers. Um, Unfortunately, in the current implementation, you actually now have a new point of failure, which is the container D daemon. So you've just kind of punted it across. Now, they plan to get to a point where the container D daemon as well can restart and then can recover state. Um, so that's not, that shouldn't be a problem for, for too much longer. Um, but then the next, part, uh, the next part that's responsible to, like, to be able to achieve that, to be able to rec for the container D daemon to recover, um, then you need to introduce another component, which is the container D shim, which means that every, for every container that container D starts up, it needs to run another dedicated daemon uh, rather than executing the application directly um, to uh, maintain the state for that so that it can recover if container D needs to restart. So there's a lot of moving parts here. Um, some of this is similar, in a sense, to the Rocket architecture in that the Rocket stage one is kind of analogous to the container D shim because Rocket, you know, starts up a process to start your different things. But you know, you'll note that the Rocket um, in the Rocket model that the pod is then this self-contained thing underneath this one. Um, host process, uh, whereas in the, in the Docker world, you're still going to have one of these uh, shims you know, for every single container in the pod. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what integration with Rocket looks like instead. Um, so as I said, you know, some of the key motivations for us is that we think it's, you know, uh, Rocket, since Rocket's a pod native runtime, since it understands pod as first class thing, that it's you know, going to provide some benefits when integrating with Kubelet. Um, and also Rocket's seamless integration with systemd means that you know, as Kubernetes starts to be deployed more and more on systemd uh, distributions, that you get this nice uh, first class support there. Um, since we have this self-contained execution model with no central daemon, then there's no um, single point of failure. Um, and then finally, you know, big, really important goal for us is that it's totally transparently swappable so that um, you can continue, you know, as a user, a user of Kubernetes or a user of Docker, you can continue using it as you would today. But the actual underneath, you know, we can swap out and use Rocket to execute and get some of the advantages of Rocket, and you don't even notice the difference. And we do this by using, for example, um, Docker to ACI, which is a project that will convert Docker image, pull down Docker images, talk to the Docker re registry, pull them down and convert them uh, to the uh, internal format for Rocket to use. So Rocket has native support for um, Docker images as well. So again, th this is kind of what it looks like, or what the two different execution modes look like with uh, when Kubernetes is using Rocket, the Kubelet's using Rocket instead. So in the, in the default mode that we're using at the moment, Kubelet actually doesn't talk to Rocket directly. It talks to systemd to start up um, Rocket prods. And then um, you know, the systemd itself is what uh, spawns up Rocket pods. Um, and then finally, to, to extract information, as I, I talked about that API service earlier, which can just run off to the side. Um, and that understands the underlying you know, databases of Rocket and you know, the file system layout and things like that. So that can provide information to Kubelet very, very efficiently about the stuff that's running, about stuff that's running uh, on the operating, uh, sorry, about Rocket pods that are running, running on the system. The nice thing about this is that um, there's no real single point of failure. Well, there is one, but. Um, you can survive, it's quite tolerant, tolerant to different failures. So for example, if the API service fails um, and needs to get restarted, you know, there's no interruption to the running containers. The Kubelet might just need to retry um, to, for a second until it gets the information back, um, but it doesn't affect any pods running on the system. If one of the rocket processes dies, since each of these processes encapsulates the whole pod, if one of the pods dies, um, then it won't affect any other pods on the system. If Kubelet dies, you know, the pods will just happily keep running. They're parented by systemd. Kubelet can come back and recover, and that's just fine. If systemd dies, then you're obviously completely hosed anyway, so we, don't, we think that's a pretty fair trade-off because that's you know, PID1 on the system. So the only entity that we're trusting in this, uh, in this architecture is systemd, and we think that's a pretty reasonable thing to trust since you, you have to trust it anyway. Um, I mentioned earlier, I talked earlier about the... the, the um, you know, Rocket and being able to execute, inheriting the context directly from where it's executed, though. And you might be wondering why we need to use systemd. Um, as I said, we think it buys that nice kind of uh, high availability where the kubelet can die and easily recover. But potentially, you know, we're exploring also implementing this model where the kubelet just directly executes Rocket pods. Um, and, and, and the motivation here is that 
if the kubelet wants very, very direct granular control over what's happening in the pod, um, then it might be helpful if it just can directly set it up. So for example, if the kubelet wants to fiddle with um, C groups and things um, inside a pod, then it can actually, if the excuse me, if the kubelet process itself is responsible for starting that process, then it can have much more fine grade control. And then obviously also you you know you get a little bit more efficiency by not needing to you know have that additional hop over the um, system D API. So this is oops, this is uh, another mode that we're potentially exploring, um, but as of today, we use the system D um, system D mode by default when integrating Kubelet with Rocket. Um, so where is this where is this at? Well, it's not um, quite complete, but it's very very close. Um, and the way that we're measuring completeness is by running the end-to-end -end tests. So Kubernetes has a quite an exhaustive set of end-to-end -end tests to you know test the whole whole behavior of the system. And so we have a um, a uh, continuous integration set up on Jenkins that is constantly testing um, you know the latest Kubernetes master against uh, with a Rocket backend. Um, we're at about about 90% of tests, so very very close. And it's a top priority to get done for uh, Kubernetes 1.3. So we work the next major release of Kubernetes. So we work very closely with the Kubernetes um, SIG node team um, to make sure that we're sort of unblocked um, and that uh, you know we get what we need in. And um, we're hoping to see this complete for Kubernetes uh, 1.3. Uh, you know, after that, after that happens, um, I talked a little bit about this in that um, about the container runtime interface in the Kubelet. And that, in principle, um, it's quite straightforward to you know implement that. But in practice, it's quite uh, complicated because of a lot of assumptions. Well, one of the things planned for as soon as 1.3 is done is for quite a big rework of that uh, container runtime interface. And um, one of the motivations there is, as I said, that Kubernetes wants much more granular control over applications and containers. So it wants to be able to you know tweak um, resources on the fly and maybe restart, um, maybe add new applications into a pod and things like that. And we're still in discussions with the Kubernetes team about you know, where the right balance is between, um, you know, we don't think it's right to go to that complete model where it's just a mass of containers and the Kubelet has to, has to, mod has to um, maintain a whole bunch of state around what a pod is. Um, but at the end of the day, they, w they are going to need to, you know, as we look at different things like over auto scaling and over provisioning in Kubernetes clusters, um, they are going to need more granular control over uh, resource constraints and things like that. Uh, so the second way that that uh, that was Rocket Netties, um, and then the second way that we integrate with Kubernetes is, as I said, the kind of the reverse is instead of using Kubernetes to run Rocket to run applications, using Rocket to run Kubernetes. Um, and the reason that we we need to do this is because you know, as I mentioned on CoreOS, we have this operating system that doesn't have a package manager, and the only way to run things is to run them in containers. So we need to run Kubernetes in a container. Um, we actually originally tried uh, putting the Kubernetes kubelet into the operating system itself, but we had some issues around upgrades, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so we think it's better to run it in a container fundamentally. But kubelet is quite special because it needs a lot of access to the host. It needs to like mount volumes, for example. So you can't just run it in a traditional kind of container um, in, a, in a completely isolated environment. So we created this new feature in Rocket a couple of months ago called, um, which we're calling Fly, basically. Um, and the idea is that it, it's basically just using Rocket as a package manager rather than completely containing you know, an application. It just runs it in an unconstrained environment. Um, but you, know, you can run an application with all its dependencies um, without having to install them on the operating system. Um, it's similar, if you're familiar with Docker, it's somewhat similar to um, uh, Docker's privilege mode or SystemD's, um, SystemD endpoints share host mode. Um, but you get all the other advantages of using a container runtime, like you know, discovering images and, and making sure that they're signed and verified and managing them on disk and things like that. Uh, so to give you an example of what that looks like in the execution, um, as I mentioned you know, earlier, the fundamental execution unit in Rocket is the pod, so all the applications run in pods. Um, and within the pod, it's an isolated namespace from the, from the host. So isolated mount namespace, network namespace, um, dip PIDs, and all those things. With Fly, the application just executes directly underneath the process. Um, it actually executes over the. It actually replaces the process, um, and it's just in the complete host um, host context. So everything is shared with the host: the PIDs, network, mount, and everything like that. Um, the only thing that's different is that you have you know the application starts in its own file system, so it has access to all its own libraries and data and so forth. And so that's how we run the kubelet um, on CoreOS. So we just basically have a simple wrapper script that executes the kubelet that, that uses Rocket um, Fly uh, to pull down the version of the kubelet that you specify um, and then run it on the, on the system. 
Um, final area I want to touch on briefly is uh, networking. So you guys might have heard of CNI, which is um, a, a sort of container networking specification. Um, CNI emerged from the Rocket networking specification. So when we developed Rocket, we wanted you know, networking to be quite because it's quite a uh, there's a lot of different opinions on what networking should be and what different networking backends are. So we want it to be quite pluggable. Um, and the key kind of uh, uh, concept, uh, the key defining concept here was that we could have one or more IPs per pod assigned at the pod level, and they would be assigned and allocated and set up via uh, plugins. Um, so basically, what it looks like is that the you know, Rocket itself doesn't understand anything about networks. It just knows how to talk to, to CNI. And then CNI is that abstraction between the different kind of backends that you would have, whether that's setting up a simple um, you know, point to point interface between your container and your host, or whether it's plugging into something like Mac VLAN so you can share the interface, uh, network interface with a host, um, or into different backends like you know, Open vSwitch, for example. So CNI is very simple uh, command line specification and simple configuration that just says, you know, add this container to this network, or remove this container to this network, and then the plugins themselves are what, you know, go out and allocate you an IP and then set up the network namespace and all these different things. Um, is a very, very simple example configuration that just, you know, allocates a simple IP from, a, from this subnet to your container, um, and then you would just specify it on the command line to rocket, for example, with a dash dash net uh, flag. Um, as I said, Rocket itself doesn't really know anything about networks, so it basically just um, creates a network namespace and then executes a CNI plugin, um, and then the CNI plugin is responsible for all of the necessary uh, network setup. Then Rocket um, you know, calls the stage one, which as I said by default is based around uh, nspawn, and that executes within the network namespace that's already been um, set up. Um, why I'm sort of talking about this is that uh, CNI, so as I said, CNI started out as the plugin model for Rocket, um, but we kind of split it out to be something more generic. Um, since there's a lot of um, kind of alignment with what how Kubernetes wanted to do the networking, um, you know, a, a couple of months ago there was a blog post by the Kubernetes team saying that um, framed a bit negatively, but actually it was quite positive in terms of they decided that CNI is going to be the network model that Kubernetes uses for all of its networking. Um, and so they're kind of working at the moment to rip out a lot of the networking code from Kubernetes and essentially just make sure that it understands CNI natively so that we can use all these CNI plugins um, across different um, systems and within Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes CNI today, it's at um, sort of what we've basically called V0.2, which doesn't mean much in particular, but um, it's used in Rocket, as I said, for all, Kuban, all networking. There's a lot of different plugins that have been developed by um, big projects like Calico and Weaveworks, which also integrate very, very nicely with um, Kubernetes. Um, and our hope is that we can donate the CNI project to CNCF, where, as I mentioned, um, Kubernetes was recently donated to, so that the CNI can have this, um, this you know, home to really flourish as a project and to make sure that it always has this first-class kind of integration with um, Kubernetes and with other um, you know, orchestration systems that, that emerge. Um, so a little bit about what's coming up. I think we're coming up on time, so I'll, I'll be quick. But um, as I said, RocketNetty's um, 1.0 is, is something we're hoping to have, uh, well, we definitely want to have finished by Kubernetes 1.3, which is roughly the end of this quarter. Um, and what that means to be finished is that it's, it's fully supported as a backend and that it's, you know, it's just full feature parity with Docker. So you literally just can't notice the difference as an end user. Um, and then the way that we sort of gu a guarantee there is that we have this automated end-to-end -end testing that's constantly running on CoreOS um, and other distributions, hopefully. Um, and we plan to, you know, at the moment that's internal, but we want to make the, that all exposed so it's all uh, publicly visible, uh, you know, the constant state. Every time that there's a PR to Kubernetes, um, that it's tested end-to-end -end against uh, Rocket as well as Docker. Um, and then looking forward for things we want to do in, in Rocket Netties uh, 1.0, um, I talked about that LKVM backend, the virtualization uh, backend, and we really want to see that working with Kubernetes, and we think that would be a great feature for Kubernetes to have, to know that your containers in Kubernetes are executing in, in virtualized um, virtual machines. Um, and then one thing we other need to tackle is um, changing the Kubernetes API to support this new image format standard, the OCI standard that we ground, since as of today, the only standard, it's a, the only image format you can specify is Docker. Um, and then uh, finally, we want to extend that uh, TPM trust that I talked about up to the Kubernetes cluster. So I think the patches are out to do this today. It just hasn't been merged yet. But the idea is that um, you know, in your Kubernetes cluster that's running on your hardware, only machines that are trusted, um, you know, have a known key in the TPM, um, are allowed to join the cluster and, and execute work. <laughs> 
Um, if anyone's interested, I'd highly encourage you to, to try Rocket Netties today. Um, since it's not all completely mainline, there's a little uh, little script that you need to run, um, which is available in this GIST. Oop. Don't know what happened. Well, there we go. Um, but hopefully by 1.3, we're hoping that will all be um, should all be main, mainstream today. Um, What's happening in Rocket? Um, what else do I want to talk about? Oh, I want to talk about CNI 1.0 because I'm really interested in, in getting kind of feedback and involvement for anyone who's interested in networking. Um, CNI 1.0 is something we want to work towards in the next couple of months. Um, and one of the things we're really interested in is having uh, IPv6 support baked in uh, natively. So there's quite a bit of active work here at the moment. And if anyone's interested, I'd love to have um, more contributions. Uh, what's that? Oh, it's coming off again. Um, how are we doing for time? One final thing I wanted to talk about is um, Kubelet upgrades, um, something that we're working on at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned, that you know, with CoreOS we want updates to be seamless. Um, but if the Kubelet was baked into the uh, into the OS, that meant when you do an OS upgrade, it might update the Kubelet. And in principle, this is fine since the Kubernetes is really big on backwards compatibility. But we actually found when we tried putting it in the in the operating system that it doesn't work. That there were some backwards incompatibilities, unfortunately, when having a mixed version cluster. So that that was one of our motivations for splitting it out to running it in a container. But then it still means that you need some solution to being able to upgrade the Kubelets running in a live cluster. So our plan here is to have API-driven upgrades um, where you can uh, no note an in annotation like on a Kubernetes node using the Kubernetes API. And then that annotation specifies what version of the Kubelet um, is actually running on that node. So we're sort of using Kubelet, Kubernetes itself to control what version of the Kubelet is going to run. Um, and then you can do it sort of perform an update in a, uh, in a, in a, in a well, in a, in a graceful manner. Um, and then the final bit of integration that we want to do with the Kubelet is I mentioned um, Earlier when I was talking about uh, up updates, when a mach machine needs an update and then it can notify your uh, container orchestra uh, your orchestration runtime, and that knows t that it can then uh, proactively migrate apps before a rundown actually happens, a shutdown actually happens. So in CoreOS, we have a component called Locksmith. It's also used in some other distributions. Um, that you know, when the system downloads an update and it says, "Hey, I need a reboot," it actually um, tells this, this daemon that's running Locksmith, and Locksmith controls the life cycle of, of, of the reboot. So Locksmith can say like, oh, I'm only going to reboot between you know, 1 and 3 AM, or I'm going to make sure that only one machine in the cluster is rebooting at once, or all these things like that. So we plan to integrate Locksmith with the Kubelet, so that when an update is necessary, um, Locksmith can tell the Kubelet, hey, um, stop scheduling any apps here, um, drain all the apps from, from this node. Um, the Kubernetes can then move the apps elsewhere, can reboot the, the node can reboot, Kubernetes can notice, oh, this, this server is up and available again, now I can start uh, scheduling work to it again. Um, yep, so that's basically the end. Um, I'd encourage you to you know, hopefully use Rocket, use Kubernetes, and try using them together. Um, and all of this stuff is open source. You know, we do all development of Rocket and AppC and CNI uh, on GitHub. Um, and we really love contributions. So I encourage you to check it out and get involved. Um, and we also have a conference on open source software in, in, in May in Berlin, if anyone's interested in, in joining. would love to have you there. And we're also hiring if anyone wants to work on containers in Berlin. So. <laughs> I think we have a few minutes for any questions. Questions? Um, what are your plans for, or do you have any plans to fully integrate with Kubernetes, like getting Rocket or LXC runtime into Kubernetes instead of pushing Rocket Netis as a separate product? Oh, uh, maybe I should have been clearer. Rocket Netis is not a separate product. This is all going into the Kubelet, in, in the Kubernetes code. Um, we just have a few small, small patches at the moment that we haven't merged upstream, which is why I linked to that gist. But we do all the work in, in the Kubernetes itself. OK, do you have any estimate on the timeline when it will be accepted in mainline Kubernetes? Um, so it's, a, it's actually in mainline today, but it doesn't quite, um, you know, it doesn't quite, oops, Kubernetes rocket. So you can go to the official uh, Kubernetes do, uh, docs. And you can see some information on getting started. Um, it is in mainline today. It's just that it doesn't all work 100%. Um, and there's some, some different requirements here. Um, but we're absolutely doing all this development um, upstream. It's just that we have some patches that aren't yet available. Um, and if you actually go to the Kubernetes project, um, 
issues. You can see there's a milestone at the moment, which is for Rocket Netties 1.0. And you can see all the um, sort of patches and things that are going into all upstream um, Kubernetes uh, to, to finalize that support. More questions? Hello. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you have mentioned uh, there is some effort to unify the format of the containers, like yep. the Docker and uh, the Rocket One. Can you like uh, uh, say how, in uh, which time frame, we can expect this uh, unified format? Uh, that's a good question. So our hope is that, um, again, we, we try to put all this on GitHub, so it's um, pretty transparent. Our hope is that we have a tentative timeline here. <coughs> So what the initial step here was just basically to import to start from the Docker v2 format, as I mentioned. Um, and then there's some things that we want to you know, introduce from AppSea that didn't necessarily make it into the Docker v2 format. Um, our hope is that we have this you know, new spec kind of done around you know, May and then around the May time frame, May time frame that you know, one of the criteria for success is that we have independent implementations. So for example, that Amazon implements it in their registry and then also that Rocket can fully support it. Um, and yeah, our, our, our hope is that by June we have something that we call a 1.0 for that, for that spec. Joe. Great talk, lots of details, thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, one little detail that you really mentioned only in passing is that Rocket doesn't have a daemon. Now it turns out that for our developers, Docker and its daemon actually was a big win since they can use it on Windows and Mac as well. So with Docker Machine, for example. Mm -hmm. So do you have any thoughts on how to go, how to continue developing software in a, on a mixed environment mm -hmm. while going forward with Rocket? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. We uh, and and to be to be honest, that's not an area that we um, focused on for a long time. We focused really on it being like a low-level tool, um, and that did make it harder for you know developers to adopt. Um, what I'd say there's a couple of things. First is that we want it to be like we want it to be part of um, uh, you know something like Kubernetes. We just see it as this small component that's part of the Kubernetes thing, so that you would develop um, against basically Kubernetes and the Kubernetes API rather than necessarily needing to develop against Rocket. Um, but in terms of if you were developing against Rocket itself, um, the option today is you know we have a Vagrant set up to, to run it in a Vagrant VM. Um, as I said, we are kind of interested in exploring things like having a, um, a stage one that runs on, on OS X. Um, there's not r no real technical reason that I can think of why that, why that shouldn't work. It's just we haven't really put the work into it yet. Um, uh, and then um, we've also toyed with the idea of having something similar to the Docker daemon that would expose an API to, to start containers and things like that. Um, I, think it's, I think we talk about it in some issues on GitHub. We just haven't prioritized it yet. Right now, our main focus is on getting it um, integrated with Kubernetes, so basically all of the work is oriented around that. And after that, we might think about how we can make it um, a little bit more usable for developers. Um, the other thing I would say on that is that it's a little bit, one of the differences with Rocket compared to Docker when you're doing development is that, for example, around building images, we don't, um, you know, in the Docker model, that all happens through the Docker daemon, whereas with Rocket, you know, Rocket itself can't, doesn't know how to build images, it doesn't really understand them. Um, we have different tools like uh, AC build, which, you know, work against the um, AppC spec, so Rocket understands the images that it builds. Um, and then uh, this, for example, should work on, uh, Oh, actually, it doesn't today. But um, there are different tools that you would use rather than doing it all through the one single tool. And those can be built against different platforms and stuff like that. So it's, it's quite a different uh, sort of philosophically from the Docker model today. We might con we're definitely considering making ways of making that easier in future. But right now, we just want to focus on um, Kubernetes. Um, there has been recently published a white paper by a Docker-related mm -hmm. organization detailing the security and secure default. Mm -hmm. And I know that Rocket has been um, kind of pushing the security way well, a little earlier than that. Um, so can you comment on that 100-page uh, white paper detailing that Docker is kind of secure by default and Rocket 
is not really. Sure. Um, first, I'll say we're thrilled that Docker is taking security really seriously now, um, or, or at least purporting to. Um, on the specifics of that white paper, we think they raised some valid issues and some issues that were a little bit strange, like when they would, um, you know, have the same, you know, same implement, same uh, status in a, in a column, but the rocket column would be kind of yellow, whereas the Docker one wasn't for no particular reason. So there are a few strange things in that report, um, but I will say that they. There are a couple of things in there that we, you know, definitely took to heart that we had on the roadmap, you know, as kind of known issues, but we just hadn't got around to sorting out. Um, I would say, uh, look, look, look to a uh, blog, look, expect a blog post from us in the next couple of weeks, um, detailing, you know, how we, some of our kind of response to that. There's a lot of stuff that we've been working on in the last couple of weeks, which we think, um, we think a lot of the stuff in that white paper is not necessarily accurate or up to date about the state of Rocket, but, but we're very happy that they have a new emphasis on security. Since we have a lot, you know, as CoreOS, we still have a lot of people using Docker, and we're happy them to keep using Docker as long as it makes sense. Okay. Thank you okay. very much for your Thank talk. You. Thanks.